Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's uh, Everbridge um, Effort Insights webinar, Social Media for, uh, for Law Enforcement and Public Safety. So today we're going we're gonna to go over the agenda first. Uh, first off, I'd like to thank you for joining us. On behalf of Everbridge, I'm excited to present this webinar. Uh, content for this webinar will include uh, using social to listen for safety emergencies, knowing which channels are best for you, engaging with your community and obeying the rules of engagement, creating and manage, managing a social command center. Additionally, we'll have a 10-minute Q&A with our two speakers at the end. At any moment, if, you, if any of you would like, uh, please follow us on Twitter at Everbridge and use the hashtag, hashtag community engagement. Also, you can uh, join our Everbridge Incident Management Professionals Group on LinkedIn at any time as well. As a reminder, uh, if you'd like to submit questions during the webinar, you can do so. Uh, you can submit your questions by typing in the open text field in the questions panel and sending your questions to all panelists. If time should run out during the Q&A, uh, before your question is asked, we'll try and follow up with you after the webinar. Uh, as always, links to the recording of the webinar and slides from today's presentation will be available on our blog uh, within just a few days. Uh, you can also look for a link to all recordings of all of our webinars on everbridge.com under our resources section. And now I'd like to take this time to introduce you to uh, our speakers. First up is uh, Mike Lewis. Mike is a marketing and sales executive with a uh, broad experience in all aspects of marketing marketing strategy, demand generation, demand creation, social media, improving sales results through marketing, articulating complex solutions to C-level executives and team management. Mike is also a part-time professor at Clark University and has authored the book Standout Social Marketing, which is available on Amazon. After Mike will be Scott Benoit. Scott Benoit is currently Nixel's Senior Director of Product Management and a certified Scrum product owner. His responsibilities at Nixel include acting as product owner for the full Nixel uh, suite of SaaS products, web-based and uh, native mobile apps, the user experience, both specifications and design, creative direction, and communicating with all involved teams during a product launch. We're excited and honored to have both of our experts here today. And now I'm going to hand it over to Mike. One second, we're just having some audio difficulties. Okay, Dad, I am really excited to be here today. Um, I want to give you a little background on me before I get going, though. Uh, so just let me take two seconds and talk to you about who I am. Uh, my name is Mike Lewis. I'm actually the Vice President of Marketing here at Everbridge. And in addition to that, I'm, the, I'm a graduate professor of social media and marketing at Clark University here in Massachusetts. Uh, last year or so, I also published a book, Social Marketing, which was um, on Amazon's top, top seller list. Uh, so if you have a chance, you can run out and pick that up. Um, in addition to all that, uh, the most important thing I am is if you look at the right, I'm a, I'm a dad. Those are pictures of my two kids there. Um, and I've, I've grown up in Boston my entire life. I've been very active in social media, actually, my entire life. Uh, or at least my business life. Um, if you have a minute, take some time and follow me on Twitter. I'm at Boston Mike. Love to hear from you. I'd love to hear what you think about today. Uh, so it's a little bit about me. I've spent most of my career working with big brands and, and, and small to mid-sized organizations to develop a social strategy. But uh, what's also interesting is I've spent a lot of time working with both law enforcement and public safety to help define social media guidelines, principles, and rules within there. And that's what I want to talk to you about today. So I'd like to start by, by saying something that I hope everybody on the line agrees with. I know I certainly agree with, with this statement, is that social media is not a fad. Now, some of you may laugh and go, well, who, who could believe that at this point? The truth is, a lot of the companies I've worked with tend to still have a, a, a certain uh, predisposition to think that social media is something that will go away or, or you know, may not last very long. But I want to share some stats real quick before we jump into the meat of the presentation. First of all, as of January 16, as of January 2016, annual growth of both social media, internet usage, and mobile usage is up significantly. In fact, the number of internet users has grown by 10%, which is about 332 million people. Um, the growth 
in the number of active social media accounts, gross of active social media users is actually up 10% as well since last year, January 2015, to about 219 million. That's a huge percentage of people that are continuing to jump on and to begin using social media. And that includes all the big networks, not just the ones here in the United States, but ones like QQ and RenRen um, in China as well as all over the world. Um, what's also interesting is that 90% of all global internet traffic is for social media. Now think about that. When you see someone walking down the street with their head buried in their cell phone, chances are that they're doing something socially, social media related. They could be checking their, their Facebook feed, their Twitter posts, whatever it is, maybe posting a picture up to Instagram. The bottom line is that the advent and the, and the increased um, usage of mobile has also increased the increase, has also increased social media. And that has huge implications for law enforcement that has huge implications for public safety uh, that we'll talk about in just a minute. A big statement for you guys, and I know this is one that maybe some of you believe, some of you might not, but social media represents the largest shift in communications in human history. In fact, you know, if you think about it, we're kind of in the midst of a revolution. If you go back in time, there really only, there really only have been four periods in roughly the last 500 years where media has changed enough to classify for a label of revolution. We're in one right now. Let me talk to you real quick about the other ones. The first was, if you think about back in the 1400s, and I hope for some of you that might be too far back, I wasn't alive for it, but back in the 1400s, something really came out. It was the printing press. And that completely rev revolutionized how people actually talk and communicate with each other. So the first time we had the ability to print stuff down and send it out to the masses. Huge evolution for, for communications for us. It was a huge revolution for for everything um, that we were doing and, and, and going to be doing going forward. The second happened about 400 years later. That was in the 1800s. And that was the advent of the telegraph telephone. That was another huge evolution. For the first time, we had bi-directional communication. Not only could we or talk to someone, but that person could respond to us in real time. Then later in the 1800s came recordable media, mostly on, on uh, records, but you know eventually that grew to then, um, cassette tape, CDs, and DVDs, and that kind of thing. And one of the most important revolutions happened in the early 1900s, the mid-1900s, which was the, the advent of television, which was, you know, again, a huge, huge, huge thing. Well, let me ask you real quick. Some of you may know what this picture is um, there. Some of you may not. It's actually not a picture of the universe. That is actually a picture of the Internet and all those nodes, and it, it's kind of a heat map that's connecting all the nodes and the different areas that people are, are communicating based on where they're located. Now, what's interesting about the Internet is it was the first time in human history that we actually had a many-to-many -many pattern. In other words, people from anywhere in the world could communicate with each other at any place at any time. It was a channel that supported all types of media. So think about it. It wasn't just a, a, a video communication or text communication or an audio-based communication. The Internet supported everything. <laughs> It often, and one of the bigger changes, one of the biggest things, is that the audience became a content producer. For the first time, it was very cost-effective for the audience to produce content. When I say the audience, I'm talking about the individual that was on the Internet, to produce content in a very cost-effective way and share it with everybody. What was awesome is that it was the first time in history that the audience was savvy enough to move from being brought to, which is a typical form of the way people are are communicated with through, through especially through mass media, do much more dialogue-based conversation, which was really important. The reason this is, and the reason it impacts everybody on the line today, is because this shift is really all about you. It's all about you. one of the points I want to make before we jump into the into the meat of this is that every content producer, everybody loves producing content. That includes residents in your own community. That includes individuals that, that work in in your local offices and buildings. We have a, an unusual, unprecedented ability to look at a lot of data and understand what people are doing um, really in our own geographic territories because it is all about them. Everybody's producing content. Everybody's communicating in social media in some way, shape, or form. And by the way, those numbers continue to rise. But let's talk about how all the stuff that I just talked, how all that this advent of social media and the importance of it um, relates to um, both public safety and law enforcement. So I want to go through today, I want to talk about the benefits of it. I want to give you some real examples on how to use social media as part of what it is you're doing. I want to give you some very specific case studies and examples of how you can get the most out of it. 
and I'm happy to take some time for some Q&A at the end. So first off, what are the benefits? What are the benefits of using social media in your, in your environment? And I think the first is if you're, if you're, in, if you're in law enforcement or you know, if you're in public safety, it gives you a very unique ability to build trust with your community. And if you look, there's a couple of, of examples I pulled um, you know, that I, to me are really, you know, really cool. One is you know, a, a, a police department talking about a, a, a run that they're doing for the Special Olympics. Another is, is someone, an individual citizen, going out and posting that they love to see uh, NYPD patrolling the subways because it makes them feel safe. This is a great way to both engage with your community, which we'll talk about in a minute, but also to be able to to build trust with what it is that you're doing, to see that you're not only someone who's looking out for them, but in a lot of cases you're a member of the community. You're, you're running for the, for the Special Olympics, as, as this case may be, or you're an actual law enforcement officer patrolling the subways, making people feel safe, making sure that they can get to where it is they need to go without having any issues. Another area, and the number two benefit, is the ability to help control reputation. It does give you the ability to talk about great things that, that you as public servants do on a day-to-day -day basis. And I found one, and again, we're going to go back to NYPD, um, that I thought was really cool. This just happened about you know, a couple of months back. But there was a, there was a big tie-up on the FDR, and, and people, on, even on social media, were upset of the fact that, that they couldn't get to where they were going first thing in the morning. And what the, what the NYPD put out was, there's a wonderful reason for this morning's FDR traffic. And they, it was because there was a woman giving birth. Uh, that they were able to do, the police were able to help actually give birth in the car and they tweeted about it. And you can see it's something that, that everybody really enjoyed reading about. So a great way to control your reputation and talk through if there are issues, maybe it's something you want to use to have a dialogue with, with your audience about, but also let them know some of the great things that you're doing. Now another one of the most important areas, and uh, you know this one is, is very recent, the example I'm going to give, is about spreading information quickly. Um, just last week, I'm sure everybody on the line knows, there was a shooting out at um, UCLA um, in California, and you know one of the one of the things that um, UCLA was able to do as a university was to make sure that they kept the student body and actually everybody coming to campus informed about where the lockdowns were and where people needed to go while they were on site. Um, if you if you look back in their Twitter feed, you can actually see uh, where they're telling people to avoid the engineering classrooms and and to let them know that the campus remains on lockdown also allowed them to know when campus was open back up, uh, both for classes and for people to be able to commute there. The, the point you know, isn't so much that this is a horrible situation, which it was, but what is important is it allowed, you know, it allowed um, the, 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 the people at the school to communicate very important information about what was going on in real time, so people could avoid uh, being caught in a, in a, in a, in a potentially uh, tragic situation. Another great Thing about social media that that I think a lot of uh, I think a lot of public safety as well as law enforcement tend to overlook is humanization and I wrote in this as benefit number four humanize your brand um, I know you probably don't consider yourself brand I know that's that's something that more companies think about that kind of thing but what I mean by that is you can actually put a human face to the stuff that's going on within the department that you're part of the community that you want to be part of the community and then active in things that are going on so I put up a, a tweet here about um, in the blue, and someone said his wife has this good luck charm, and, and it's actually a police officer who's out in patrol, involved in the community, and smiling, and, and, and being part of the things that are going on. Again, I say this is one of those, I think, um, uh, police and, and specifically law enforcement as well as public safety tend to overlook. One of the things we're going to talk about a little later is not just tweeting the stuff, or, or I shouldn't say tweeting, through social media to talk about issues that are going on, but to also use it as a way to engage your brand systems with who you're talking to, talking to members of the community, engaging with them, having conversations with them. And the reason for all these benefits, I mean, if you think about it, it's really, really powerful for your brand. It's incredible uh, for your agency. It's an incredibly powerful thing for you to do. It's incredibly powerful because it gives you the opportunity to directly with the citizens that live in your community. It gives you the opportunity to understand what their challenges are. It gives you the opportunity to identify crisis areas that you need to respond to, engage immediately or in real time. There's a lot of power behind it. So the big question is, it all sounds great. I'm, I'm into the benefits, right? Well, what can I do? Well, let me outline some of the basics. And some of these might be very basic for some of the people on the phone. Others might be a good place to start. The first is to have a presence. 
without a presence, there's really very little you can do in social media. Now, I put up a couple of, of my pages here just to give you an example. All I wanted to show you is that there's one thing about my presence that you should all notice, and that is that, is that it's very consistent. I use the same pictures, I use the same backgrounds, that kind of thing. Now, even though I'm an individual, I recommend this to every single agency I work with. And the reason is, you want to make sure that people are going to look at you on Twitter, if they're going to look at you on Instagram, if they're going to look at you on LinkedIn, if they're going to look at you on Facebook, that everything is in line. So they have a really good understanding. They know where they are. They know exactly who you are and what you're going to be talking about. A couple of tips to that. Be incredibly consistent with what it is that you put up there. Respond to your community and be human. Don't sound like a robot. You want to be able to, to talk to people as though that you're talking to someone that you just met in real life. If you see something happening, be very open to having a conversation with who's out there and be able to communicate with them. Also, be open to networking. One of the great things about social media is it allows you to connect with individuals within your community. Don't be afraid to start conversations with people, ask how things are going, um, to report you know some, some great things happening in the community, as well as letting them know some tips about what's, what's going on. Now, one word of caution, and you can see that there, there are a lot of what I'll call social media fails that law enforcement and, and public agencies have made in the past, and we'll talk about some of those in a minute. But what happens in Vegas stays, what happens on, in Vegas stays on YouTube, on Facebook, on Twitter, on Instagram. Be careful about what it is you post and when you post it. Don't get into a verbal argument with people, don't get into a social argument with people. Uh, that stays there for the world to see. And be very careful with how you position responses to people in the community. In some cases, believe me, I know I've been there. Um, you want to fight right back and, and have arguments with people over social media. The key is to remain consistent, remain calm, and make sure that you understand that whatever you put out there is going to stay there for the world to see. Because your community is watching. And here's an example um, of, a, of, a, of a Twitter campaign that, that hit some backlash uh, for NYPD. And I'm not going to get into the details of it because, quite frankly, um, I was in a, 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 a fan of the backfire that happened with it. I was actually pretty upset by it. But if you take a look and you Google um, NYPD backfires and, and what happened there, you can get a sense of what actually went on and, and where some of these issues issues took place. The biggest thing I've mentioned is connecting with your community, and that's step two. So don't be afraid to search. And you should always search by searching relevant community conversations. See what's happening inside your community. Um, allow community, follow community members, follow staffers, follow citizens, follow known offenders or criminals that you know of in the area. We're going to get into some more specific details on it, but understanding what these people are doing, you'd be surprised if you weren't doing it already, how open a lot of people are, and I'll talk about some examples in a minute, to sharing illegal things that they're doing, to share, um, to, to you know, share really bad things in social media as well as some of the good things. But don't be afraid to follow everybody and listen to what's happening overall and everything that's happening in your community. Because listening is probably the most important step in social media. I know it, a lot of people think it's about how you're going to communicate or how you're going to talk. In reality, it's all about what you hear. Listen to specific areas for potential crimes. Listen to individuals that are committing the crime. Listen to the community, the community to hear what their complaints are so you have a good understanding of it. Um, there's a lot of great search unit tools. If you use search.twitter.com, um, you can actually search within specific areas to be at large, understand. Uh, better what's happening in that specific geographic area. So, for example, you might say, I want to search everything that's happening in Boston, uh, or search specific people within Boston. You get an understanding of what it is they're saying and how they're saying it. Engage can be appropriate. So, one step is to listen. The next step is obviously to engage and, <laughs> and be appropriate. Um, it could be as simple as retweeting or liking or sharing. That, that could be as simple as your engagement is. Um, you can guarantee return engagement if you want someone to talk to you by personalizing the interaction. So by saying to someone, "Hey, I noticed you were you were uh, you know at that concert last night. Did you have a good time? Um, or you know we, we were at that community event last night. Um, did, did you enjoy it? That kind of and seeing thing. An interaction with anybody that's out there is going to guarantee it is, gives you much more like personalizing that you should respond and have a conversation, and that allows you to build a relationship. And overbuild that relationship, it's important to keep it. So one of the points I mentioned earlier is to, and what's your distance and how you talk to people. Um, social media isn't something that you should use sporadically, especially more of the micro, um, the micro blogging type, for example, Twitter. Consider part of micro blogging even though it's with, with photos or if you have a Facebook page. 
feature gram are inconsistent up there daily allows you not just to build a relationship with individuals, but also with your thin community. They expect to hear certain things from you. They look at you as a valued resource as you go forward, including step away. And I want to share with you some, some specific view cases that I think uh, specific to law enforcement that I think you'll, you'll really enjoy and, and at least get a sense of how some other areas are using it. One is what, what I like to call the social media thing. And it's actually been used uh, quite a bit by different agencies around the ping operation country. The most common example, the one you probably see on NBC uh, to catch a predator. They actually use it to, to trap pedophiles. Um, you know, they film it and, and, and you know, obviously show the takedown and um, you know, the, the people coming to a specific site on um, social media. But it's been used in other, um, other cities, other towns, other, other agencies as well. So you look, there's, I pulled an article from Polk, Polk County where social media, uh, a social media uh, child sex thing they had 18 arrests and 103 charges against men who were, uh, um, uh, you know, being investigated for birth or child pornography. Another way it's being used, um, a thing is, is going on actually right now. It's still underway, and it's been very publicized. So it's strange that it's still going on, and people haven't noticed it. Um, maybe it's the maybe it's by what it's all about. Uh, police are using social media for marijuana things in Denver. So they're actually setting um, they're setting up pictures and telling people that there are new crops ready illegally, and people are actually writing in and saying that they'll they'll buy it or meet in person to buy gigantic amounts of, of marijuana. There's been also a lot of reports about gang-related uh, type sting operation. And I'll talk about that a little bit more uh, when we when we talk about one of our one of our next areas, uh, which is location tracking. So one of the cool things about social, especially if you're using a tool like Instagram, is that every photo and every place a photo was taken is actually tagged, which is really interesting and very important for some, for law enforcement. Uh, this data, the, the photo part, that links to text pictures and location is such a great tool for law enforcement to find uh, specific suspects. You can actually pinpoint areas where they are and, and have that geotag. So you can actually see where people are, what they're doing. What's more important, and if you're if you're doing this you know, in general, you can also choose to follow specific individuals on social media and listen to what it is that they're doing. Really important, in fact, that you do this in your area. If you have a known list of, say, sex offenders, if you have a known list of, of, of uh, you know, drug dealers, gang members, you can actually follow them and see what they're doing and what they're talking about. A story came out of Florida last year where a couple of gang members took guns illegally and then decided to take pictures of themselves with the guns on Instagram posted them up to Instagram. The police, because they were following them, knew about it immediately. I believe it was in Miami-Dade County, and were able to make arrests almost on the spot uh, because these guys were bragging about the fact that they had brand new guns that they had bought stolen um, and were planning on using them on, on rivals. So, um, the point is, people are very open, and in some cases too much on social, and it gives you the opportunity to, uh, to really pinpoint and track where not only what they're saying, but where they are when they're saying it. So you can actually get very close to the areas that they're in and know where there might be hot spots for activity you need to look at. One of my favorite areas for, for social media, in addition to some of the other ones, is public outreach. And I have a whole bunch of stuff up here. One is something we talked about before, the public outreach that happened last week at, at UCLA. Another great example of public outreach through social is, um, is during Super Bowl 50, uh, um, you know, using, uh, alerting the actual public to traffic situations or where they should be parking or or potential areas of, of, of um, where there might be issues to avoid in the Super Bowl, all throughout the Bay Area, uh, social media was used to do that. And it was done really effectively. It was um, something that people could actually get real-time information on. During, there have been some other great public outreach examples. For example, uh, um, you know, an escaped inmate was recaptured thanks to social media. Um, you know, water main break, force of school closures, uh, again, more stuff you can do that you can let the public know about what's happening and how these issues are, are coming and, and what they need to do to avoid potential roadblocks for it. All great examples for it. You know, another, there are a bunch of other ideas that I wanted to share with you and things that have come up you know, with, with different groups that i worked with. One is very simple. It's, it's actually establishing a, a blotter, uh, police blotter blog, you know, actually creating a blog where not only can you put up you know, tips for the summer or pool safety tips or you know, whatever it is, but you can actually put the police water out and, 
and um, you know blog about you know where it is that you know the police have responded, what issues have come up over the past you know call it five days. It gives you fresh content, but it's also something that your citizens really appreciate. They want to be able to come out and, and read some of that information to see what's actually happening in the in the area. One interesting one that that also you know is a great idea for folks to use is what I call the digital wanted poster, um, where you know people can actually go out and, and post and ask for the public's help in, in capturing um, you know specific individuals or to figure out who the you know where those individuals are, um, and that that goes back to something that is you know another big big area for a lot of a lot of communities, which is anonymous e-tipping. You know the ability to go in and and send tips anonymously on specific individuals or groups you know that are potentially going to commit a crime or have committed a crime, and then tracking tracking and informing on on Twitter. I think a big part of of what you do on Twitter or, or and actually I put on Twitter. I should be really specific that tracking and tracking can be done on, on really any social site, whether it's Facebook, whether it's Twitter, Instagram, uh, where there's been a lot of activity on any of those sites. You have the ability to be, be able to track on and understand what's happening in each one. Um, but more importantly, uh, you can give people the ability to inform over those as well. So again, creating that bi-directional communication where you're actually working with the individuals at your you know, in your community to, to help respond to, to issues as they come up. And of course, just informing the general public on information. So, you know, hey, there's a building fire at 45 Adams Street in Dorchester. Please avoid the area. You can see that tweet from Boston Police that was just sent out a couple of weeks ago. So people know that, you know, we need to avoid this area and get out of it. So in summary, I think, you know, there's a lot of stuff that can be done in social media. I think the basics for both law enforcement and you know public safety, is to begin by by starting with the basics. Really, is 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 what I call the blocking and tackling. Getting your presence up, starting to listen, and then executing on specific programs. Now, there's a bunch of different tools that you can use um, as you as you go out and start to look at how you're really going to engage with your community and, and promote public safety and law enforcement. Um, but I'm going to pause here, and I think we're going to take some questions and then turn it over to Scott. Um, but I'll turn it back over to Mike to see uh, what's next. Thank you, Mike. Actually, we're gonna we're gonna hand it over to Scott first, and then do uh, some Q and A. Uh, so, Scott, I'm gonna hand it over to you right now. Okay. Thanks, Mike. Good afternoon, everyone. All right, Mike. If you could just confirm that you can see my screen. Uh, one second. Yep. Looks good. All set. Great. Okay, thank you everyone. Um, so I think we can all uh, agree that it's incredibly important to kind of tap into these various social networks that are out there. We talked about Facebook, uh, we talked about Twitter, um, but just a little bit on my background, I do, uh, I, I come from uh, Nixle, so we, Nixle was uh, really interested in connecting local public safety agencies to their residents. So over the course of the last several years, we've really kind of been cultivating our own social uh, network, right? So when the Everbridge acquisition occurred, it was actually a really good um, combination um, of functionality because as Nixle built up these user bases at a municipal level, the county level agencies that were using Everbridge were able to send messages to those, uh, those contacts that belong uh, to the Nixle um, network, right? So the idea here is uh, Nixle agencies were very active in sending out daily, uh, weekly notifications, uh, and then Everbridge customers are able to leverage all of those contacts that are being added at the municipal level. Um, so this is kind of the cycle that we see uh, when agencies are trying to build up a user base. Now, um, you when you begin with Facebook or you begin with Twitter, you are going to start with zero followers, right? And then uh, over the course of, you know, sending out frequent publications, you will be building up your user base. That consistent messaging uh, that Mike Lewis spoke about is what will really help you drive um, opt-ins. And the same is true with the Nixle system. Um, so this is kind of the cycle that we see uh, on the Nixle side and with opt-ins in general. The more that you publish, the more that your brand, your, your agency gets in front of the residents, 
that makes it more likely for those residents to share your content across their social networks, which ultimately leads to more opt-ins, right? So if you use the Everbridge product to, let's say, send a Facebook notification, somebody may read that and say, hey, how do I opt in to get that kind of information? They may want to receive that over SMS. They may want to receive that over email, not just viewing it in their Facebook feed, right? So it really just adds exposure to your, to your agency um, and then at the end of the day, the real benefit here is when that emergency does occur, you will have that opt-in base to call upon. So as you publish more, people are opting in more, your user base, your opt-in base is growing, and you know, God forbid there is a, an evacuation notice or some sort of natural event, you will have that opt-in base to get your message to. So a lot of benefit there. Uh, so just an idea of uh, how uh, what the Everbridge and Nixle footprint looks like. We have over 9,000 public safety agencies across the U.S. Um, using the service currently. Um, and that really kind of plays into our opt-in um, strategy. Um, we want to make it as easy as possible for residents to opt-in because ultimately that will give your agency a more robust opt-in base. And we provide at opt-in tools, um, two primary opt-in tools. One is users can go to nixle.com and they can sign up. So they enter their, their email address, they enter their location, and they sign up. It's very simple. Uh, but the second way is even simpler. Residents can actually text their zip code to 888777. Um, so what does that look like? Very simple. So in the in the place in your messaging app where you would enter a phone number, you simply enter 888777, and in the body of the message, you enter your zip code. And when you send that message, what you're essentially doing is you are opting in to every agency that services that zip code. Now think about this from a, a resident's perspective. It's a very powerful model. Um, and it's actually uh, a very powerful model for your agency as well because, again, let's look at the Facebook and Twitter models. If you start on Facebook or Twitter tomorrow, you start with zero followers. Well, with this model, if you were to come on board and let's say that your agency had some sort of jurisdiction over this zip code, 91016, you would immediately have access to all of the opt-ins in this area, right? So 91016 is actually my zip code here in Southern California. If I was to text this zip code to 888777, now again, just uh, this is from a resident's perspective. I text my zip code in. I will start receiving messages from all four of these agencies, all three municipal agencies. Uh, if there are multiple county agencies, I would receive messages from them as well. Now, from an agency's perspective, let's say um, these four agencies, they all have access to the same 1,000 users that belong in the 91016 zip code. Now you can imagine if a fifth agency, let's say, came on board tomorrow, they would immediately have access to all 1,000 users. Right? So again, if you were to contrast this against the Twitter model, um, the Nixle Everbridge Community Engagement Solution really does have that built-in opt-in base for you. Um, and as you are publishing your messages to your community, you know, the hope is that 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 cycle that we looked at earlier keeps spinning, you keep adding more users, uh, and ultimately uh, you continue to grow your opt-in base. Um, so let's say you've, you know, you've set up your keyword, you've come on board with community engagement. Um, we will help you get the word out to your, to your residents. So we, we've seen a lot of great and inventive ways that agencies have um, gone about trying to get that call to action in front of their residents. Right, hey, text 94002 to 888777. That's really all you have to go out to your residents with, and it's just a matter of how do you get that message in front of your residents. Just one example is uh, digital signage on your roadways. Uh, you may want to do uh, utility bill inserts. You may want to pass out flyers at your local, um, your local elementary schools, for example. Whatever uh, we can do to help, we have best practices for how to get the word out um, but again, a lot of uh, great ways to get that call to action in front of your residents. Um, so let's talk about event groups, another very um, popular feature 
uh, within Everbridge community engagement. Um, so event groups are really um, geared towards those local happenings where you may have an influx of visitors to your city or town, um, you know, coming from other towns, potentially from out of state, in some cases maybe even from, you know, out of the country. If you have people coming to your community, how do you keep them all up to date, right? Twitter is one way, uh, Facebook is another. Um, but what if you want just one quote unquote channel to communicate with people who are only interested in one particular event? Um, so the event group functionality is a great way to do that. So uh, similar to the uh, text your zip code to triple eight triple seven, you can create a group and assign a mobile keyword to that group that is event specific. So let's say I have a jazz festival coming up in the park this weekend. Um, I want residents to be aware of any sort of um, traffic um, restrictions for the event or maybe uh, if there is severe weather headed the way headed our way, I want to let residents know about that. Um, how do I do that? So I would set up this mobile keyword, let's say jazz festival. And now again, I would get this this call to action in front of my residence. So it could be um, signage, it could be flyers passed out around Main Street, whatever it is, text jazz festival to triple eight triple seven. And when residents do that, they are now signing up to a very specific group. They are signing up to one group for your particular agency to receive information related specifically to the Jazz Festival. All right, so it's a little different than the zip code. Zip code, I'm opting into multiple agencies. Keywords, mobile event keywords, I'm opting into one group for one agency. Um, and so let's say you've um, you know, you've set up those keywords, you have a, a group of community subscribers who are waiting to receive your message. Very easy to target those groups directly from your Everbridge notification form. So the same form that you inter interact with today, uh, there would be a few additional publishing options. So as you're going through that form, crafting your message, uh, you would be able to select, you know, which zip codes do I want to send this message to? or which event groups do I want to send this message to. So very easy to target those. And just a few examples of the kind of keywords that you could set up. So if you're um, part of a higher education institution and you have graduation coming up, you could set a keyword up for that, get that in front of uh, alumni, family, uh, faculty, and just send updates related to the graduation ceremony. Or if you have a marathon or a, a public transportation uh, system that's maybe undergoing construction and there's going to be delays and you want people to stay uh, up to date on that. Or maybe there's a conference coming up. You want to have some signage at the door. As people walk into your event, they can opt into a keyword and now you can message them throughout the duration of the event. So a lot of great examples uh, of how to use uh, the mobile keywords. And just a little glimpse into the future. We in the um, in our summer release, which is scheduled for July 15th, you will very easily be able to see what your opt-in numbers look like right from the Everbridge dashboard. Uh, so you'll see there are two new additions here, your community opt-ins. So this, these are the users who are texting their zip code, right? so they belong to uh, a geographic region. And then you'll also be able to see users who belong to your specific event groups. So in both cases, you'll be able to see the trending data. You know, maybe you put out a press release and you want to see what your numbers look like the day after, right? So this will be a great way to kind of gauge the effectiveness of your opt-in campaigns. And again, this is scheduled for July uh, 15th. Um, so just a few uh, quick use cases just to kind of demonstrate the power of the event group functionality. Um, in late September, the Pope visited the city of Philadelphia. Um, great event for the city. They were expecting uh, around 1.5 million attendees over the course of a weekend. Obviously a lot of uh, coordination uh, between departments, a lot of uh, logistical concerns around parking, um, you know, just the first aid tents were around the city. So there are a lot of little details of the event that they wanted the visitors to be aware of. So what they did was, um, they came up with a plan, uh, and the plan, and again, this is this is Everbridge working with the city to figure out. Um, so ahead of time, we really sat down with them, figured out how we were going to 
um, get as many opt-ins as possible and make sure that we are message, messaging them in the most effective way. Uh, and the plan uh, consists of a good strategy for getting people before the event, getting them to opt into your keyword. Right? So there's a number of ways that we can do that as we discussed. Uh, so how, do, you know, how did Everbridge help the city uh, accomplish that during the event? Uh, important to send very relevant messaging related to the, the papal visit. And then after the event, uh, what, you know, if a, a resident is opting into a very specific event group, what do they do after the event is over? So we have uh, best practices on um, directing your users to opt into a broader set of information. So the city set up papal visit as their keyword. Uh, they did a great job getting the word out. So there was uh, press conferences, local media pickups. They were sending this call to action to Facebook and Twitter. Text papal visit to triple eight triple seven. So they did a great job at getting the word out. Um, and you know, very encouraging stats. But in seven days, they were able to amass eleven and a half thousand opt-ins. Uh, and if you compare that against the traction on Facebook and Twitter uh, in the previous seven years. Uh, you'll see that this uh, this graph is just very representative of the job they did getting that call to action in front of their residents. Um, so it just it really speaks to the power and the ease of getting people to opt into your messaging. Um, during the event, they sent out some great messages. Um, it, they had to do with weather. Um, you know, Pope Francis, where he was uh, in relation to the the festival route, um, just good messaging in terms of uh, traffic. So at the end of the event, what the city did was they urged their residents to opt in to a zip code. Right? So uh, let's look at this from a resident's perspective. I opt in to papal visit. I'm, I'm receiving information related to that specific event. After the event, the city sends me a text message and asks me to reply with my zip code. Now, when I do that, I have now opted into all of the other public safety information in my area, and I can continue to receive those messages. So it's just a great way to kind of get those uh, residents who are interested in the event to opt into an even broader set of information. Um, a second use case, uh, more recently with Super Bowl 50, um, there were um, roughly 15 agencies in the Bay Area who collaborated um, around a uh, Super Bowl specific campaign um, to manage all of the, the visitors who were coming into town for the Super Bowl. Um, so the Super Bowl was held uh, about 45 minutes south of the city of San Francisco, but all of the agencies along that corridor from San Francisco um, to um, Santa Clara were all involved because they were all expecting um, a surge in, in visitors. So they, they worked together, they created one keyword, it was called SB50, uh, and jointly they went out and they uh, did a great job at getting the call to action uh, in front of the media, in front of residents, using social media, press releases, um, et cetera. Um, so a lot of good pickup, um, and we saw similar numbers. So in a very short amount of time, they were able to uh, amass over 10,000 users. Uh, and again, these are users who are opting in over text message, uh, and they uh, are able to receive those messages over text. And those text messages will actually click through to a full message. Right? So if you only have a user's cell phone, there needs to be a web message where they can view a full set of information. Uh, so that's what community engagement offers. You send a text message, the text message includes a link that points to a full message. Um, so in the case of Super Bowl 50, again, they did a great job of saying, hey, thanks for signing up. Now reply with your zip code to receive even more information. Um, and uh, the other um, feature of community engagement is direct integration with Facebook and Twitter. Obviously very important to stay on top of your Facebook and Twitter notifications. This really speaks to the concept of having consistent messaging across all of the various social networks where your, you know, your online communities are. You may have people following you on Facebook, following you on Twitter. Directly from Everbridge, you can send messages directly to those channels 
Um, so the setup is extremely easy. So you are able to link multiple Twitter and multiple Facebook accounts to your Everbridge account right from your settings page. And then during the publication process, it's extremely easy to actually target those channels. So similar to the Nixel channels, um, as you're going through this notification form, there is a new option for social media. If you select that, you are then able to select all of the various social channels that you'd also like to target. Um, also, we offer direct integration with Google Public Alerts. So Google actually takes all of the high priority community messages that you send and it redistributes them across three of their uh, properties. So if you were to publish, let's say, a tornado warning, Google will take that warning and actually put it at the top of their search results. So now if somebody is in your community and maybe they hear a storm uh, approaching and they go to Google and they type in the word tornado, your alert will be at the top of their search results. So it's a way to get your message in front of all of those Google users. So very exciting partnership. We're the only uh, company to offer that. Um, in addition, your message would be at the top of uh, Google Maps uh, and also in Google Now, which is an app that comes pre-installed on Android devices. Um, so just to look at kind of the, the channels that you're able to publish to, uh, you will get that web page that we discussed. You will be able to send to Facebook, Twitter, uh, Google Public Alerts. Uh, you will, of course, have the ability to target those people who are joining your event groups, who are joining your community by texting uh, their zip code to triple eight triple seven. Uh, so you really have a whole new uh, group of users that you can use Everbridge to tap into and to send messages to. Uh, and then lastly, let's uh, let's touch on OneBridge. So OneBridge very simply is, it's an application that residents can download to receive public safety information. Uh, they can sign up for uh, notifications for their primary neighborhood. So in this case, let's say I go through the registration process, I enter my address, the app will put me in my home neighborhood. So we have a neighborhood database, it will assign me to a neighborhood, and now all of the agencies that can publish to my neighborhood I will receive those messages in my feed. So very similar to the zip code opt-in where I, I sign up and I'm receiving multiple uh, you know, information from multiple agencies. Same concept here. I sign up, I have a feed where I, I, I see all of this local information. Um, and I can actually sign up to other locations throughout the country. So if I have a loved one on the other side of the country, I want to stay in touch with that area, uh, I can easily do that. I can also post to my neighbors if there's something public safety focused that I want to uh, alert my neighbors to, I can actually send those messages out to my neighbors. Um, and as a resident, I can also submit anonymous tips. So from an agency perspective, uh, anonymous tipping is supported through the Nixel product currently, but in 2017 we do have plans to bring this tipping functionality to Everbridge Suite. So from a resident's perspective, let's say I'm looking through my feed and I say I, I see a post about a wanted um, suspect. Now each message um, that is soliciting a tip will actually have a, a little button that says uh, submit a tip. So if I do have information related to this notification, uh, I have a few ways to submit that tip. Uh, I can submit it over SMS, I can submit it over a web form, uh, and both are extremely easy. Um, web form allows you to send um, more information, but right from your phone you can actually text in a tip. Uh, so a very uh, easy system for residents to submit their tip. And as an agency user, after you receive that tip, you can actually open up a two-way conversation with the tipster uh, to get more information. Um, and then the last thing, uh, is uh, social sharing. So another very powerful concept is once you share your message to OneBridge, residents can actually share it to their social networks and that, and that really helps ultimately drive more opt-ins um, for your agency. Uh, and I think with that, Mike, we're, uh, I know we're coming up on time here, so thinking we can open it up for questions. 
Thank you, Scott. So with that being said, again, thank you, Scott, and thank you, Mike Lewis, for your presentations. We're going to turn it over to our Q&A session. So at this point, just as a reminder for anyone on the line, um, you can submit your questions um, by typing uh, a question into the open text field in the questions panel on your screen and submitting it to all panelists. Uh, as always, we'll answer as many questions as time allows. Uh, if we cannot answer some of them, we will have, uh, for Everbridge customers and Nixle customers, we'll have your account managers reach out to you um, or uh, a product specialist for those non-customer users. Um, so our first question uh, comes from Joe uh, in the field. He wants to know, can multiple agencies publish to a singular zip code? Scott, I, I'll throw that over to you. Um, yeah, exactly. So that's uh, that's the... Uh, the basic idea of the zip code opt-in. So um, let's look at it from both sides. A resident opt -in, opts into a zip code. The resident is basically saying, send me information from all agencies that can publish to this zip code. Um, and from an agency's perspective, if, if that zip code is within your, your jurisdiction, within your, your county or city limits, you can publish to it. You will have, uh, you have access to all of the opt-ins in that zip code. Uh, and that same uh, logic would apply to any agency that has um, uh, jurisdiction over that zip code. So, um, again, I think um, I think I'm actually a good case here. I do live in an area where there are uh, several agencies who are all sending uh, great notifications for my zip code. Excellent. So the next question uh, is for you, Mike Lewis. Uh, Jim Groves in the audience wants to know regarding uh, one second. Regarding the consistency, for an emergency management organization, should you personalize it with people's faces or uh, with the department, uh, the department's brand, example, logo, seal, et cetera? Mike, can you hear me okay? All right, great. Um, that's a great question. I think, you know, it's, uh, I've seen it done both ways, right? I don't think there is a right or a wrong answer to it. Um, what I will say, though, is that I tend to lead lean more towards the personalization side. So, um, you know, having someone's face, having someone that you can identify with, you know, that, that isn't just a seal or a logo, uh, tends to humanize a brand more. Now, that said, um, I, I've seen it done both ways really effectively. So I, I don't know that there's a right or wrong answer to it. I think it's a preference thing. Um, but, you, you know, like I said, I've seen it done both ways. I tend to prefer the humanized look and feel. Excellent. Um, and Scott, the next question is a more of an Everbridge question. So um, Daniel wants to know, can you, and I guess for Mike Lewis as well, can you set, um, can Everbridge be used um, in Nixel for hospitals or a private organization? Um, it absolutely can, yeah. So the, um, the functionality around event groups um, have proven to be um, very successful for hospitals. Uh, as well as corporations and higher ed institutions. So um, absolutely, so hospitals, higher ed, uh, corporations can all leverage this functionality. You'll also be able to tap into your, your various social networks uh, that we went through. So linking your Facebook and Twitter accounts to your Everbridge account. Um, so absolutely. Excellent. The next question uh, comes from uh, Peter. He wants to know, um, are you for uh, or against allowing Facebook fans to rate your agency in regards to uh, police agencies? And Mike, that's for you. Yeah, I mean, my answer is, is, uh, is no. I, I, I don't, I'm, I'm not a fan of that because that's really not what, what um, you know, in my opinion, it's not what Facebook was designed for specifically. I mean, they put that in there really to rate restaurants, hotels, that kind of thing. Um, I, I'm really not a fan of letting, you know, the public just go ahead and, and rate your your police agency. Okay. So the next question is from Peter as well. And Scott, this is for you. Um, and I believe the answer is yes, but not quite yet. So I'll throw it your way. 
Uh, do all Nixle users have access to the Everbridge social dashboard? It would be excellent to see graphs and charts that show, for example, how successful an, a membership drive was for Auto. Yeah. yeah, so the functionality, as I mentioned, is um, being introduced to the Everbridge suite in the summer. Uh, later in the year, we want to bring that same functionality into Nixle. Um, so, yeah, exactly as uh, I think Peter stated, as you're running these campaigns, uh, it's really important to see how they're performing. Um, and it helps drive those best practices for the next campaign. So uh, we certainly do want to bring that functionality uh, over to the Nixle side. Uh, but again, that would be either later this year or early uh, 2017. Okay, perfect. Um, so the next question is from Monica. Um, she wants to know, um, Scott, does the Nixle program work in conjunction with OneBridge? And how does OneBridge assist Nixle uh, agencies? Um, yeah, great question. So um, OneBridge does work in combination uh, with Nixle. So anytime a Nixle agency targets their Nixle wire group, uh, which is that default group of community subscribers, that message will go to OneBridge. Um, and OneBridge is actually in the App Store. Um, and what we're in the process of doing is taking all of the users um, that have signed up for local.nixle, uh, and the center is mostly for Nixle users who are familiar with the system. But all of the residents who have signed up for local.nixle will eventually be moved over to OneBridge. Uh, so all of the publications that agencies are sending, um, and again, if you target your Nixle wire, that message will show up in OneBridge. So it is currently integrated as of now. Perfect. And Scott, there's actually a, a, there's a question regarding uh, keywords that uh, I'd like you to give clarification to Jeff on. So sure. he wants to know, are event groups specific to a zip code? Um, uh, because his concern is, so there is no confusion if two marathons were created with the same keyword. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so keywords are actually unique across our system. So um, think, you, think of it as a, a URL or a domain name that you purchase. They have to be unique. Um, so if you were to try and enter, let's say, um, you know, marathon as your keyword, chances are that keyword has been taken. So um, you may want to do LA marathon, whatever it is to kind of make it more specific to your location or the year. Um, but yeah, so keywords are unique across the system and we, we, we will warn you in the UI if you're entering a keyword that's already taken. Thank you, Scott. Mm -hmm. The next question is for you, Mike Lewis. Um, Alex, uh, he has a question uh, regarding social media, and he wants to know, Mike, should agencies uh, sign up for uh, multiple social media pages and manage them uh, beyond Facebook, Instagram, Twitter? Uh, what else is out there that you recommend, if anything? Well, there's a, there's a lot out there. Um, one thing I'd recommend is, uh, you know, beyond the, the traditional ones, so Facebook, Twitter, um, Instagram uh, is is probably the most basic, and that's that's having some kind of blog. Um, you know, I was just reading an article or, or a blog post this morning by by my friend Chris Brogan, and, and basically the point of the article was uh, blogging isn't dead, and it's not by a long shot. It's actually a great way to to um, to both engage with the community as well as as well as um, you know, communicate important messages to everybody. So I think at, at a minimum, you want to have a blog as kind of your landing page for for anything that you're doing in social. Um, but, and those are probably the big, you know, the, the the biggest ones. I think you know there there are probably a bunch of other new. Well, there are not probably, but there are a bunch of other new social networks that are popping up, like Blab, um, the, you know, Periscope. I mean, a whole bunch of different ones. I, I'd say focus on the on the ones that you mentioned, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, as well as uh, making sure you have a blog up to direct people to. Perfect. Thank you, Mike. So the next question is from uh, Jim in the audience. Scott, you actually mentioned this, but uh, he, uh, he must have missed it. He says, with Nick, so can a person opt into more than one zip code? For example, he works uh, in, in one part of the town uh, and but lives in the other, which both have unique zip codes. Yep, that's exactly right. So you can opt into as many zip codes across the country as you'd like. Perfect. So um, it's just about it's just about top of the hour. So I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna run one more question again. Any questions that we didn't answer, we will follow up with. But I did want to get to this last question. Uh, so Mike, 
Um, uh, Jeff uh, Benanto in the audience want to know, for pre-planned events, how should agencies handle messaging uh, to build awareness around them? That's a great question. Um, yeah, I think what's, what's interesting, so the, if I'm understanding it right, it's how should agencies manage pre-planned events that are already happening in an area? Uh, yeah, so what he, I guess uh, for, uh, what he's asking is um, how, what, how should agencies handle, like how, how far in advance, he actually just said another question, basically how far in advance uh, should they be sending message for a pre-planned event such as a festival? Oh, oh okay, now I'm, I'm with you. Um, you know, as early as you can, I think the more time you have to actually build up an audience and let people know what's going on um, is, is really important. It's, it's funny, I actually, um, you know, in, in the town I, I live in, uh, in Burlington, they, they are doing this summer concert series, and they actually started doing it almost halfway through winter. I mean, they were, they were marketing the people that were coming in and going to be on the, on the common, just to let people know that it was coming over the summer so people could pe start to plan their, their summer vacation schedule. So, you know, I mean, I don't think you want to do it a year in advance, or depending on how big the event is, you might want to do it a year in advance. You know, if you're talking the Super Bowl, um, it's going to come to your town, you got to let people know about it. But I think for the smaller festivals and stuff that are happening in your area, the sooner the better for it. And, and the more communication you can give, and that's why Nixle is such a great choice to, to, to help people with, is you can opt in to get updates and, and uh, you know, on specific keywords around it so you can really see what's going on and understand it. Awesome. Well, with that being said, um, that's going to be conclude our session today. Uh, as always, I'd like to thank our two speakers, uh, Mike Lewis and Scott Benoit for another great session, and to all of our attendees who were able to join us today. Uh, if you missed any part of our webinar, be sure to look for the slides on everbridge.com backslash blog. You'll also receive an email with a link to the recording in the next uh, few days. Uh, also, if you haven't already, please take a moment to follow us on Twitter at Everbridge. Uh, for any updates regarding webinars, white papers, etc. And join our group on LinkedIn, Everbridge Incident Management and Emergency Notification Professionals. Thank you everyone and have a great rest of your day. Thanks everyone. Take care.